This is the story of World War II, from Blitzkrieg to the bomb. From Blitzkrieg to the bomb is made possible in part with funds provided by this public television station, which depends largely on viewer contributions. Please join with your support. Fascist Italy in the late 1930s. Militaristic in appearance and brutal by nature, this new form of government is headed by a former Italian socialist, Benito Mussolini. This would-be Caesar dreams of a new Roman Empire which will control the entire Mediterranean region. In 1935, he invades Ethiopia, one of the first aggressive acts that will eventually bring the entire world to war. Mussolini is Europe's first dictator, but it is Germany's Adolf Hitler who becomes the symbol for the fascists. This former World War I corporal and his Nazi party come to power in 1933. One year later, Hitler proclaims himself Fuhrer of the people as all opposition is crushed. In exchange for abandoning democracy, Hitler promises the rebirth of Germany, a Third Reich that will last a thousand years. There are many reasons why the German people knowingly delivered themselves into the hands of a dictator. Since World War I, the German government had struggled under the burdens of the Versailles Peace Treaty and worldwide depression. In contrast, the Nazi party offers the promise of a new way of life. Discipline and order will take the place of uncertainty. Much of the country's economic ills are blamed on Jews who are singled out for persecution. Internationally, Hitler denounces the Versailles Treaty and bans the fears of communism. At the same time, Hitler orchestrates colossal parades and gigantic spectacles as proof of the resurgence of Germany. The German people are mesmerized. In 1936, Germany and Italy form the Rome-Berlin Axis. The third member of the alliance will be Japan, still another nation with plans for territorial conquest. With its growing industrial base, Japan finds itself in need of raw materials. The Japanese first aggressive act was against Manchuria in 1931. Six years later, this tiny island nation invades the giant, China. But in the late 30s, much of the world's attention is centered on the increasingly belligerent Hitler. In 1936, he marches troops into the Rhineland, a demilitarized zone bordering Germany, France, and Belgium. Two years later, Hitler achieves the bloodless annexation of Austria. He declares that Germany has no more territorial demands to make in Europe, but soon he is menacing Czechoslovakia. To resolve the Czech crisis, the Allied leaders meet with Hitler in Munich. As the discussions take place, Germany is mobilizing four million men for war. Threatened and bullied, the Allies give in to all of Hitler's demands. The well-intentioned but gullible Prime Minister of England, Neville Chamberlain, believes he has found the answer to peace in his time. The piece of paper which he holds says only that in return for the territorial demands on Czechoslovakia, Germany promises to seek peaceful solutions to differences with the Allies. Yet it will be another treaty that will ignite World War II. Besides England and France, Germany faces a formidable foe to the east, Stalin's communist Russia. Historically, the two nations are natural enemies, and Hitler has previously singled out communism as an enemy of the Third Reich. But Hitler fears communism less than the possibility of a war on two fronts. 
1939, Germany and Russia shocked the entire world by announcing the signing of a non-aggression pact. The secret provisions of the treaty free Hitler to attack Poland to the east. In exchange for allowing the invasion, Hitler promises Stalin half of the Polish territory. Only one week following the signing of the pact, without a declaration of war, Germany invades Poland. It is September the 1st, 1939. World War II is underway. The attack against Poland is the first to use a tactic known as Blitzkrieg, or lightning war. It is a strategy that will revolutionize modern warfare. The Blitzkrieg delivers a 1-2-3 knockout combination of tanks, motorized infantry, and air power. Columns of German Panzer tank divisions take the lead, piercing defensive armies which are stretched across long territorial borders. Once the front lines are penetrated by tanks, motorized infantry pours through, outflanking, and finally surrounding the defenders. Meanwhile, from the air, dive bombers concentrate on destroying bridges, roads, railways, and other lines of communication. The German Stuka bomber is designed for just such a task, with its ability to perform steep dives. Almost as terrifying as the Stuka's deadly bomb loads are its screeching sirens, which give the plane its distinctive sound. For the Polish army, with its strategy based on the trench warfare of the First World War and its equipment and weapons obsolete, the outcome is inevitable. Cavalry units are slaughtered as they charge German tanks. The Polish capital, Warsaw, is left no more than rubble by German air attacks. It is the first of many cities that will suffer from indiscriminate aerial bombardment. Two weeks after the German invasion, with Poland near collapse, Stalin orders his Red Army across the border to lay claim to Russia's portion of the vanquished nation. The occupation and suppression of Poland is the responsibility of the feared German SS. Under the direction of Heinrich Himmler, the SS murders thousands of Polish civilians who are declared enemies of the German state. Countless numbers more are shipped away to serve as slave labor, the first of millions to suffer the horror of the Nazi concentration camp. During the Blitzkrieg, Poland's reluctant allies, England and France, had declared war on Germany as they had promised to do. But little was done to help the doomed country. By all accounts, France has the largest and finest army in all of Europe. Following the invasion of Poland, one Frenchman in eight is called to duty as the nation cautiously prepares for war. Like Poland, the French commanders are better prepared to refight the battles of World War I than the modern Blitzkrieg. The French strategy is almost entirely defensive in nature. It is centered around the defense of the Maginot Line, an amazing string of heavily fortified bunkers armed with heavy artillery. These 20th century castles stretch the entire length of the French-German border. The French boast that the Maginot Line is indestructible. It is also immobile, and against the Blitzkrieg, it will be obsolete. Germany's generals will decide merely to bypass it. Prepared to fight a defensive war, the French sit and wait. The British, meantime, moved troops across the Channel. Hitler, protected by the non-aggression pact with Russia, is free to move his troops to the Western Front. 
The winter of 1939 will later be called the phony war as declared enemies stay behind their lines waiting and watching in plain view of each other. A strange but temporary calm before the full fury of the war erupts. By the spring of 1940, Hitler is ready for his next move, a strike to the north to capture the neutral nations of Denmark and Norway. Hitler's paratroopers secure the northern flank of Europe. Under intense pressure, British Prime Minister Chamberlain resigns on May 10, 1940. His successor, Winston Churchill, takes office on the same day that Hitler orders an all-out attack on the Western Front. The German military machine again strikes with amazing quickness. Small diversionary forces and artillery duels occupy French troops stationed on the Maginot Line, while the main German attacks come from the north against Holland and Belgium. Like Poland, the assault is not limited to military targets, as cities and their civilian populations are bombed by the German Luftwaffe. There are more civilian casualties than military losses for the Dutch. surrenders after just five days of fighting. On this same day, Churchill is told the grim news by France that the battle for Western Europe is already lost. Belgium fights on, but this small country is no match for the panzer attacks. Prior to the German invasion, Belgium had refused to allow Allied forces to enter its territory in hopes of preserving its strict neutrality. Disorganized and ill-prepared, the Belgians surrender unconditionally on May 28th, just over two weeks after the first German assault. Meanwhile, panzer divisions continue to stream through gaping holes in the Allied lines. In France, 16 generals are dismissed. Germany takes full advantage of the Allied paralysis of command. Although they are outnumbered in men and tanks, the Germans cut an armored path all the way to the English Channel, cutting the Allied army in half. Severed from supplies, ammunition and reinforcements, the northern Allied army is trapped. It retreats to the only escape left, the French coastal port of Dunkirk. The Battle of Dunkirk has been called the most successful military evacuation in all of history. Others call it simply a miracle. The miracle occurred in large measure because of Hitler's order to halt his panzer troops for three critical days just as the evacuation is beginning. The reason for Hitler's order has never been understood. Instead of allowing his troops to finish the kill, Hitler assigns the annihilation of the encircled Allied army to Air Marshal Hermann Göring. But bad weather grounds the air attack, and again, the destruction of the Allied army stranded on the beaches is delayed.
To save the Allied Army, a British armada comprised of every conceivable type of floating vessel, including many civilian craft, ferries back and forth across the channel for nine days. Many are hit by German planes, now trying to make up for lost time and bad weather. In the end, a third of a million troops escape to England. Only 40,000 men are left behind, mostly French troops who have fought a rearguard action to slow down the German advance. On June the 5th, one day after the final troops escaped from Dunkirk, the Germans turn south towards Paris in an assault that hurls over 100 divisions into the French lines. France crumbles. Most French divisions already lost in Belgium and most of the French air force destroyed. The battle to save France becomes a humiliating rout. Seeking to share in the spoils of war, Mussolini declares war on France on June 10th. Two days later, Paris is declared an open city. On June 14, German troops march down the Champs-Élysées. France, once self-assured behind its marginal line, finds itself a conquered nation in a matter of weeks. With an irony lost on no one, Hitler arranges for the surrender ceremony to take place in the same railway car in which Germany had been forced to accept the terms of the armistice of 1918 ending the First World War. Under the terms of the 1940 armistice, France is divided in half. German troops occupy the entire northern half of the country, including all of France's coastline. The southern half is left in French hands, but governed by a puppet regime of Germany. Following the surrender of France, England, in one of the great ironies of the war, attacks the French Navy to keep it from falling into the hands of the Axis powers. The former allies find themselves all but enemies, a scar that will take many years to heal. The French troops who had escaped to England are loosely organized into a fighting force. Its leader is a little known French general named Charles de Gaulle. Germany's success with the Blitzkrieg had surprised the entire world. The modern army of France had fallen just as quickly as the cavalry charging Poles. Nothing seems capable of stopping the Nazi military machine. With the capture of France, the war in Western Europe is over. It is an enormous victory for Hitler. Yet, in allowing the English army to escape from Dunkirk, Hitler had made one of the great strategic errors of the war. The British army rescued from the Dunkirk beaches contained most of England's experienced troops. They would fight another day. But only after the heroic Battle of Britain, the first major air battle of the Second World War. As early as July 1940, Hitler had ordered secret preparations for Operation Sea Lion, the invasion of England. The plans call for first destroying the British Royal Air Force. The German air commander Goring promises to wipe out the RAF in four days and begins massive air raids against England's airfields and radar stations. The British are outnumbered in planes three to one, but they score kills of two to one against the Germans. With the aid of the newly developed radar, which Goring fails to knock out, the British know when and where the German raids will take place, allowing them to make maximum advantage of their smaller number of planes. The RAF pilot is called upon to fly multi-missions each day, going up time and time again to meet German bombers and fighters in the sky. But 
gradually the German attacks wear down the number of British planes and their pilots. In the first two weeks of the battle, a quarter of the British pilots are lost and the remainder are in desperate need of rest. Yet just as Hitler's order to halt the attack on the Allied forces on Dunkirk had saved the British army, another decision by Hitler would cost Germany the battle for Britain. On the night of August 24th, a German squadron of bombers accidentally drops its bomb loads on civilian targets in London. Churchill orders a retaliatory raid on Berlin. An enraged Hitler redirects his air attacks from military targets to the city of London itself. It is Hitler's second major error. The blitz against London begins September 7th and continues night and day for two months. London is virtually destroyed. terror bombing would break the will of the British people. Instead, Churchill is greeted with cries of we can take it by his countrymen. The suffering endured by London gives the British Air Force the time it needs to recover, retrain new pilots and build new planes. With England still capable of protecting its skies, Hitler postpones indefinitely the invasion of England. It is a pivotal point in determining the outcome of the war. Hitler's failure to defeat Britain would mark the beginning of the end for the Third Reich. While Hitler conquers Western Europe, Italy's Mussolini begins the conquest of the Mediterranean in October 1940 by invading Greece. The Greeks offer stiff resistance and the Italian army is stopped. Mussolini's efforts in North Africa meet with even less success. By February of 1941, the Italian army fighting against the British in East Africa surrenders in droves to the famed Desert Rats. Coming to the aid of his Pact of Steel ally, Hitler sends troops into Greece and North Africa. The battle for Greece, which had stalemated Mussolini's army, readily falls to the Germans in a matter of days. Hitler also orders to Africa one of Germany's brightest commanders, General Erwin Rommel who is soon placed in charge of the Desert War. Rommel had distinguished himself in the Blitzkrieg of France, but in Africa, he will become legendary as the Desert Fox. Rommel halts the rout of the Italian army, then counterattacks in March 1941. are pushed all the way back into Egypt, placing the strategic Suez Canal in jeopardy. With these successes, Hitler has reached the high water mark of the Third Reich. North Africa and the Mediterranean are under control, while most of Europe is under Nazi rule. Only the British remain, isolated on their island and in Egypt. With this view of the world map, Hitler decides to launch his largest blitzkrieg. It ultimately will be Hitler's third and most devastating miscalculation. Operation Barbarossa is to be a surprise attack against Russia. artillery barrage, the Panzers roll across the Russian border on June 22, 1941.
Stalin had received numerous warnings from the Allies that an attack was likely. But the usually highly suspicious Stalin had turned a deaf ear. The German attack is the largest military invasion in history, as some 200 German divisions attack a Russian front 2,000 miles long. to the Black Sea, eight million men find themselves engaged in a battle of titanic proportions. Stalin's troops are caught by total surprise. The German Stukas virtually wipe out the entire Red Air Force before it has a chance to leave the ground. By the end of the first day's fighting, the Panzer units have plunged some 50 miles deep into Russian territory. Besides the element of surprise, the Germans also have the advantage of fighting against inexperienced Russian officers in the field. Most of Russia's experienced commanders were removed as a part of Stalin's political purges in the 30s. Soviet troops are taken prisoner by the hundreds of thousands. At first, Russian civilians welcome the Germans, hoping for relief from the oppression of communist rule. Instead, they find the Germans even more brutal. With his armies on the verge of collapse, Stalin pleased by radio for his countrymen to fight to the death for Mother Russia. Stalin also orders Russia's citizens to carry out a scorched earth policy. Like Napoleon's troops a century earlier, the Germans find homes and crops in flames, wells poisoned, and livestock slaughtered. Remembering another lesson from history, Stalin trades Russian territory for time as his army falls back in face of the German advance. Besides land, Stalin can also afford to sacrifice soldiers. Russia's population outnumbers Germany three to one. The German advance is finally stopped, not by the Russian army, but by the autumn rains. Dirt roads become quagmires of mud, bogging down machines and men. Hitler, based on his previous successes, had hoped to capture Moscow in eight weeks. But four months after the invasion, the greatest of Stalin's weapons joins the battle, the Russian winner. It will be the coldest winter in half a century. The Germans are ill-prepared for the bitter cold. In weather beyond comprehension, weapons and vehicles freeze and refuse to work. Many German soldiers, dressed in nothing more than summer uniforms, simply freeze to death. By early December, the greatest of the Blitzkriegs is halted, all but in sight of the spires of the Kremlin. Hitler refuses to allow his men to dig in for the winter, an impossibility anyway with the ground frozen solid. The Germans suffering the misery and death of the Russian winter, Stalin strikes back with a counterattack. Soviet divisions smash into the German lines around Moscow, relieving the capital from the German threat. To the north, the Soviet port of Leningrad is in a state of siege. 
Its three million inhabitants are entirely cut off by the German army. The only supplies trickle in by truck convoy, which travels across the frozen Lake Ladoga. The people of Leningrad suffer as much from hunger as the constant bombardment of German guns. Thousands die each day from starvation and the intense cold. Across the Eastern Front, it is a winter of icy death. By the end of the year, German losses are estimated at one million casualties. Soviet losses are believed to be at least three times that number. When the spring of 1942 finally arrives, Hitler launches the second round of his Eastern Offensive. With the heavy losses taken with the first Russian Blitzkrieg, Germany can no longer afford to move against the entire front. Hitler decides to maintain his central position near Moscow. He concentrates his offensive to the north on Leningrad and to the south on the city of Stalingrad and the region's oil fields. The streets of Stalingrad are witness to some of the most bitter and savage fighting of the war. The capture of this industrial city on the Volga becomes an obsession for Hitler, far outweighing its strategic value. He demands that his commanders capture the city by the end of August, but the Germans encounter a Russian army unwilling to concede an inch of the 30-mile-long metropolis. Stalingrad is fought for house by house, street by street, block by block, an urban battle lasting four months. While the defenders of Stalingrad and Leningrad occupy the German army, Stalin amasses new troops and tanks. In November, the Soviets strike back. attempting to capture Stalingrad suddenly finds itself completely surrounded. Like the citizens of Leningrad, the exhausted German army is trapped, battling against cold, hunger, and the revenge of the Russian army. Ignoring Hitler's order to fight to the death, the encircled German army surrenders. Less than a third of 300,000 German soldiers have survived. Far fewer would ever return home. While snow turns red with blood along the Eastern Front, the United States draws closer to entering the war. Although not actively engaged in fighting, the Axis powers see America as neutral in name only. The 1941 Lend-Lease Act, passed by the U.S. Congress, allows President Roosevelt to aid any country whose defense is essential to American interests. Besides the war in Europe and North Africa, the United States concerns itself with the aggressive activities of Japan. As tensions grow worse between the two countries, the United States embargoes the trade of materials crucial to the Japanese military. While diplomats negotiate for a solution in Washington, the Japanese launch a surprise naval air attack at Pearl Harbor on December the 7th, 1941. Like victims of Germany's blitzkriegs, the United States Navy is caught totally by surprise as some 350 Japanese fighters and bombers strike without warning or declaration of war. 
seven American battleships are destroyed or knocked out of commission. Fortunately for America, its three Pacific aircraft carriers are at sea when the attack occurs. They are now all that is left to defend America's western coast. A united America declares war on Japan on December the 8th. Three days later, Germany and Italy declare war on the United States. The war is now truly a world war. Hoping to dominate the entire Pacific region, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor is quickly followed by the capture of Guam, Wake, and the Philippine Islands. But their advance is finally halted with the battles of Coral Sea and Midway. By breaking Japan's secret military codes, America knows in advance that a Japanese invasion force is moving through the Coral Sea towards New Guinea for an eventual invasion of Australia. Armed with this information, a smaller force of American carriers intercepts the convoy. The engagement marks the beginning of a new era in military tactics. For the first time, aircraft carriers will do battle. sea is fought entirely by planes as both sides attempt to destroy the other's carriers. Japanese and American ships do not even come in sight of one another as the entire battle is fought in the air. After two days of intense aerial attacks, both sides withdraw. They have each lost one carrier. Both sides claim victory but the Japanese invasion is turned back. It is but a prelude to the epic battle of Midway. In May of 1942, an armada of some 200 Japanese ships sails for the Midway Islands. Again, the American Navy is forewarned by information secured through the breaking of the Japanese military codes. Like Coral Sea, the Battle of Midway is an aerial battle. For four days, the two navies fight for their lives against plane attacks. dropped and low on fuel, damaged planes seek the safety of their carriers.
For many Japanese pilots, there is no flat top to return to. Four Japanese carriers and one heavy cruiser are sunk. More than 300 planes are lost, and 3,500 men are dead. The U.S. Navy suffers the loss of one carrier and one destroyer, 150 planes and 300 men. The invasion of Midway is canceled. It is the turning point in the Pacific War, a battle from which the Japanese Navy will never recover. The battle for control of the Atlantic Ocean is changing as well. The German U-boat, for so long a terrifying and effective weapon against Allied shipping, begins suffering heavy losses. Once free to roam the Atlantic in wolf packs to prey on nearly defenseless merchant ships, the U-boats are stopped by better radar, improved convoy techniques, and the use of air and sea escorts. By the end of the war, an assignment to a German U-boat means almost certain death, as few of them return home from sea. Just as the tides are changing in the world's oceans, the fate of the Allies in the desert begins to shift as well. For months, the North African campaign has been a series of attacks and counterattacks. While the British hold on to Egypt, Rommel commands most of North Africa. Dissatisfied with the progress made by his generals, Churchill travels to Egypt to see firsthand the reasons for the stalemate. In a shift of command, General Bernard Montgomery is placed in charge of the British Eighth Army. In October of 1942, with his troops amassed, resupplied, and enjoying a two-to-one advantage, Monty attacks. Rommel is pushed out of Egypt and across the Libyan desert. In fleeing, the desert fox directly disobeys Hitler's orders to stand and fight. His retreat of over 1,000 miles is one of the longest in military history. While the British move Rommel from the east, the American GI makes his first appearance. From the west, General Dwight Eisenhower lands invasion forces in French Morocco and Algeria. Rommel, now pursued on two fronts, realizes the African campaign is lost. His troops hold out until the spring of 1943, when a quarter of a million Italian and German soldiers surrender. Rommel and less than a thousand of his men escape to the continent. The momentum of the war had suddenly shifted to the Allies. Hitler and his seemingly invincible armies had now been defeated on battlegrounds in Africa and Russia. The dreams of a Pacific empire for Japan were beginning to set. The invasion of Europe begins with an attack on the island of Sicily in July of 1943. This Mediterranean island is the stepping stone to Italy. Operation Husky is commanded by British General Montgomery, with General George Patton leading the American 7th Army.
the Germans fight for a month before abandoning the island and leave behind 135,000 soldiers as prisoners of war. After the fall of Sicily, Benito Mussolini is removed from power. Called the most hated man in Italy, he is arrested and held captive. His ally, Hitler, sends a commando team to rescue him. Mussolini, now ill and powerless, is appointed the leader of a puppet regime in northern Italy. In September, Montgomery's 8th Army lands in Italy. A week later, American GIs hit the beaches along the Gulf of Salerno. With the Allies firmly entrenched, the new southern Italian government does an about-face and declares war on its former ally, Germany. Hitler's reprisal is quick and brutal. Nearly two-thirds of a million Italian soldiers find themselves German prisoners of war. Italy would not prove to be the soft underbelly of Europe the Allied leaders had hoped. The struggle for Italy lasts over a year as German commanders take full advantage of the mountainous and highly defendable terrain of the north. captured until June of 1944, but it is to the delight of the Italian people. Two days after the fall of Rome and the defeat of Italy, the final assault on Hitler's empire begins on the beaches of Normandy. The Allied objective is to recapture France by landing on its shores and driving the Germans back past the Rhine and to eventual unconditional surrender. Charged with defending the French coast is the Desert Fox. Rommel's strategy is to defeat the Allies on the beaches. It is here, he declares, that the war will be won or lost. preparation for an invasion, Rommel orders the construction of massive concrete fortifications. He also directs his engineers to line the beaches with barriers, mines and traps. Rommel's counterpart in England is General Dwight Ike Eisenhower, who is placed in command of the Allied invasion. He has an army of some three million soldiers, sailors and airmen. The first wave of landings alone will deliver over 175,000 troops to the beaches of France. It is the largest amphibious force ever assembled. On 6, 1944, the first Allied soldiers land on the beaches of Omaha, Gold, Juneau, Sword, and Utah. It is a battle that will later be called the Longest Day. By nightfall, the beachhead is firmly secured with Allied troops again in France. Just as Rommel had predicted, the war had been lost on the beach within the first 24 hours of battle. As foot soldiers land in France from England, Allied bombers hit German targets. The British fly their missions at night to avoid heavy losses. The Americans fly daylight raids at higher altitudes. Though at more risk than the British, the American daylight bombing provides greater precision. The combination proves deadly as the all but defeated Luftwaffe can no longer even defend Germany's cities.
Seeking revenge, Hitler launches two new secret weapons against London. The V-1 is a gasoline-powered unmanned bomb, the world's first cruise missile. Over 2,000 of these buzz bombs fall on London. Even more terrifying is the V-2, a guided missile. Flying faster than the speed of sound, the V-2 gives no warning and cannot be shot down like the slower V-1. Over a thousand V-2s rain down on Allied targets. As terrifying as the V-2 proves, it does not affect the invasion or the outcome of the war. By July 1944, a million Allied soldiers are on the European continent. They shove the German army farther back towards the Rhine. In Paris, the French resistance is no longer an underground activity, as its members fight openly against the remaining German occupation troops. Eisenhower directs French and American troops to take the city. On August 25th, Charles de Gaulle and the rest of the Allied troops enter a freed city. By mid-September of 1944, the American First Army reaches the border of Germany. There is talk of ending the war by Christmas. In hopes of outflanking the German lines, General Montgomery proposes the dropping of three airborne divisions behind German lines in Holland. Market Garden proves a major setback for the Allies as the paratroopers land in the midst of two panzer divisions and are cut to pieces. Germany is now in serious trouble, as it is fighting wars on three fronts. The Russians to the east, Americans and British to the south from Italy, and French, American, and British troops from the west in France. The draft age in Germany is lowered to 16. In hopes of slowing down the Allied advance, Hitler plans for his final offensive, the Battle of the Bulge. In the midst of winter, the Germans amass 200,000 troops and attack a weak point in the Allied Western Front held by some 80,000 Americans. The surrounded 101st Airborne Division is asked to surrender. The American reply is nuts. The encircled troops are rescued by Patton's Third Army, which arrives as a belated Christmas present on December 26th. The 60-mile deep penetration of the Allied line is turned back. The Battle of the Bulge ends as the German army, its resources spent, begins a retreat. It had been the largest battle fought on the Western Front. Although the outcome of the war could be seen, the Allies realized that much bitter fighting remained. In the Pacific, the American forces begin the conquest of the Japanese islands. General Douglas MacArthur had vowed to return again to the Philippines. The recapture of these islands would see the greatest naval battle in all of history, the battle for Leyte Gulf. 
Like Hitler's desperate battle of the bulge, the Japanese gather the remnants of their navy, some 70 ships and over 700 planes. The Japanese forces outnumbered better than two to one, but odds are of little consequence, as this battle is a suicide mission. Leyte Gulf is the first battle to use kamikaze pilots. To be a kamikaze pilot is considered a great privilege. The word kamikaze itself means divine wind. battle, Japan has lost over a third of her fleet, including four carriers. American losses are five ships and one carrier. The naval war in the Pacific is over, although Japanese pilots continue to slam their planes into American naval ships. During the Battle of Okinawa, some 5,000 seamen are killed from suicide attacks. From the sea, the Pacific fighting shifts to the islands as U.S. Marines fight stubborn Japanese defenders in the Philippines, Iwo Jima in Okinawa. For the Japanese, surrender is not an option. Suicide is preferable to capture. One by one, the islands are taken. With the end of the war in sight, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin meet in February of 1945 at Yalta on the Black Sea. Here, the three allies decide to divide Germany into four occupation zones. Eastern Europe is placed under Russian influence, but free elections are promised by Stalin, who breaks his promise within weeks. Eastern Europe has been under Soviet domination ever since. Churchill, who had led his British countrymen with such valor throughout the war, would soon be voted out of office. Roosevelt, frail and in poor health, would be dead of a stroke in two months. Two days after the Yalta conference, Dresden, Germany is targeted by Allied bombers. 800 British bombers by night and 300 American bombers by day incinerate Dresden with a massive firestorm. Of no military consequence other than its railway system, over 100,000 civilians are killed. But the most horrifying symbol of man's inhumanity to man in World War II would be the discovery of the Nazi concentration camps. The invading Allied troops find atrocities and cruelty beyond description or human comprehension. As one death factory after another is uncovered, the magnitude of the suffering caused by Hitler's Third Reich is finally known. Some 12 million people had died in the camps from disease, starvation, mutilation, and the gas chambers. Nearly six million of them were Jews. The gas chamber had been Hitler's final solution. In late April, Soviet and American troops meet some 75 miles south of Berlin. Germany has been cut in two. Berlin itself is near collapse from advancing Russian troops. 
On April 28th, Mussolini is captured and shot. His body is sent to Milan, where it is strung up by jeering crowds. Two days later, with Berlin in flames, Adolf Hitler is believed to have committed suicide, his body burned. On May 2nd, 1945, Berlin falls to Russian troops. The thousand-year Reich had lasted but 12. Victory in Europe for the Allies was finally at hand, after six years of destruction. In the Pacific, the island fighting goes on with appalling losses. With its navy destroyed, most of its soldiers either dead or captured, and its cities in flames, the Japanese still refuse to surrender. American military commanders begin plans for the invasion of Japan, a campaign with American casualty estimates of one million. After hinting of prompt and utter destruction, on August 6, 1945, America sends the B-29 bomber Enola Gay over the Japanese city of Hiroshima. instant, the city and some 80,000 Japanese people are vaporized. Three days later, a second atomic bomb is dropped on Nagasaki. On August 10th, the Japanese government sues for peace. The official ceremony takes place on August 15th aboard the USS Missouri. General MacArthur, in accepting the Japanese surrender, would say, Today the guns are silent. A new era is upon us. Even the lesson of victory itself brings with it profound concern, both for our future security and the survival of civilization. The Allies celebrate the end of the war. Yet even as crowds cheer in England, France, Russia, and the United States, former allies grow distant and cold. As MacArthur had declared on the deck of the Missouri, the end of the Second World War marked a new era. In the atomic age, tanks, ships, and planes would matter less than the microscopic mysteries of the atom. The bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki had changed the world forever. We have lived ever since in dread of a third and final world war.